Institute Cooperative Broadcasting Council presents Harlow Shapley, the theoretical scientist as creator. Essay number four in the National Association of Educational Broadcasters series, The Creative Mind, produced by WGBH-FM in Boston under a grant from the Educational Television and Radio Center. These conversations explore the creative process as it pertains to the American artist and scientist in the 20th century. And here is our host and commentator for the creative mind, Lyman Bryson. It's often said nowadays that the arts in our country suffer because so many of the first-rate uh, imaginations, the first-rate creative minds, are drawn off from consideration of art and the values and the ideals uh, into science, into the discovery of that one uh, value, the truth. I think it's very difficult to discuss the comparative usefulness of science and art in our civilization because, well, for one thing, the scientists have two strikes in their favor to begin with. We credit uh, our great material wealth, our massive technological development to the scientist and his partner, the engineer, of course. And also now we are very conscious of the fact that the scientist may be our reliance for national survival. Uh, but it isn't uh, uh, so important to tell which one is the most important. The humanist would always insist that uh, there's no use surviving in a world that isn't fit to live in and that unless we have the arts as well as the scientists and use our creative powers in art as well as in science, the world can't possibly uh, be a world in which we would want to survive. Uh, the one thing, of course, uh, in common between the scientist and the artist is that they are both men who use their intellect, their logical powers, uh, and their imaginations to create something. In uh, our time, uh, we've been vastly stirred by the creation of ways of knowing that have taken us far out into the galactic spaces and uh, given us almost a sense that someday we can follow the satellites uh, into those far spaces. Um, men uh, lie awake nights nowadays wondering about traffic problems in interstellar space. Uh, orbit has become uh, a half-serious uh, common verb. Uh, it's not uh, necessary under these circumstances to ask whether or not a scientist is a man with a creative mind, but it becomes more than ever necessary to ask uh, what does he create. Uh, to put this in perspective, consider that it takes about $20 million dollars to run a good university in the United States for a year, and that this little trip to the moon, which would give us a few uh, radio uh, records and perhaps some camera shots of that distant place, would cost us about as much as to run a good university for 100 years. This is the sort of thing uh, which public opinion sooner or later will have to face and decide. This isn't a new problem. It's a very old problem. The philosophers in ancient Greece who started all of our traditions in philosophy and thought, the Western world, up to the time of Socrates, were very much like our physicists and chemists today. Uh, they were trying to determine uh, with what tools they had the nature of the universe. They did pretty well, as a matter of fact. They hit upon the idea of evolutionary change. They hit upon the idea of atoms as the central building blocks of the universe. Uh, they laid the foundations for mathematical uh, thought but Socrates, and after him, Plato, of course, uh, his most influential pupil, uh, decided that it was not so important to understand nature, it was far more important to understand man. This real problem is not do scientists have imaginations, you see, it's whether or not scientists uh, use their imaginations on the right things. Now, in our recorded conversation with Harlow Shapley, a distinguished astronomer, uh, it's important to note that he's the author of a recent book of speculation on the meaning of modern science. Uh, he can talk about his work uh, as a philosopher as well as as an astronomer. He touches on this question in his book, Of Stars and Men, and I'm now reading a sentence from it. The task of the proper scientist is to bring forth and explain as best he can the raw materials from which other analyzers can fabricate philosophies and suggest, if they will, programs and goals. Now, how does a creative mind work in fulfilling that high mission to provide the raw material for our philosophies uh, of value? One way to distinguish the scientist creator from the artist creator would be to say that the artist creates new ways of feeling, uh, 
The scientist creates new ways of knowing. Now, that's much too crude, of course. It doesn't really state all of the difference. But it's true to this extent that we test the validity of what the scientist tells us by what we can, uh, what we can verify. Uh, we test the validity of what the artist says to us uh, by what we feel. And in both these, there are lucky discoveries. In Mr. Shapley's charming story about how he discovered something, not in his uh, studies in galactic space, but uh, in his studies uh, in myrmecology, his studies about the ants. It always has given me a kind of ironic amusement to think that the man who has taken us furthest into the last reaches of uh, the known uh, uh, world, the known special universe, is also a man who's given what is left over of his uh, energy and his intellectual power to the study of the uh, smallest creatures on earth that uh, can be called citizens, the smallest creatures on earth that seem to act in a kind of travesty of human beings. Now, uh, we notice in Professor Shapley's conversation with Mr. Kavnis that uh, uh, however he uses his creative mind in the strict confines of science, he still believes in his human right to speculate and to wonder about the most ultimate questions of value and destiny which men are faced with today uh, as always. And this, I think, is extremely important because if the scientists, uh, if science as an occupation, as a human, human uh, uh, ideal occupation has drawn off so many men and women of great power and great imaginations, we surely want them to take their share of the burden in determining what these values shall be. They can prepare the raw materials, as Mr. Shapley says, but what about having them also help us with their powers in determining what we can make out of those raw materials into ideals. Mr. Shapley is nevertheless, uh, uh, as an astronomer, he's a scientist, using a scientist's tools, such, uh, for example, as uh, experimentation. Well, if you mean by experimentation, observation, I would say it's at least as important in any of the other fields, perhaps excelled only in physiology, maybe, and in chemistry. But uh, if by experimentation you mean handling the material and pushing things around and repeating, then the astronomer's at a great disadvantage because you can't get a hold of the stars very well. And you, I know, have done a lot of work in the business of measuring the, the size of the universe by the, the variable stars, the Cepheid stars. Is, is this kind of observation a sort of experimenting? It's both, in my experience. That is, uh, I've done a great deal of observation, either photographically or visually, on uh, stars that vary in light. That's what we mean by a variable star. Say, uh, Cepheid variables, that's just one of several kinds of variable stars. I've worked, actually, more observationally in a variable star called the eclipsing binary. Wrote a doctoral thesis on it and helped develop the theory of it. But in general, on uh, this particular question, we uh, mix theory and observation. We mix measurement and interpretation. And uh, I've never been very good as a practical astronomer in accumulating observations just to store them away and say they will be very valuable 100 years from now because they give the light of a star as of now. That hasn't been very interesting to me. It is a little more routine than even I, as an astronomer, can take happily. The Cepheid variable star I worked on in two different ways that might answer your point a little better. In the measuring of them, finding that their light goes up in general rapidly, then slowly down, up and down, up and down, perhaps in every 12 hours, perhaps every 12 days. That was an observational operation. But also, I had a happy hunch one time, you might call it inspiration if you want to, that we ought to be able to get a better interpretation of what makes those stars vary. Those stars, like the North Pole star, Polaris is a Cepheid variable star. And every few days it's brighter, for, then fainter, brighter, fainter. A sort of a pulsation, then. Sort of a pulsation. In fact, that's the word we used, and I concocted a so-called pulsation hypothesis of Cepheid variation. I did that when I was not very far along in astronomical work, and curiously enough, that has persisted. And the current 
interpretation of sepiate variation, that is the variability of the North Pole star and stars like that, is known as the Shapley pulsation hypothesis. Not quite correctly, because mine was an interpretation without serious investigation of the meaning for, of those pulsations in the interior of a star. Sir Arthur Eddington uh, developed the mathematical theory, and I often say I believed in my theory until he proved it mathematically. Then I was a little skeptical. <laughs> well, can we say then that, that uh, in, a sense, in a larger sense, this, was, this began as a kind of experimentation, or as you put it, observation, in that your observations led to the forming of the hypothesis, and the, the hypothesis in turn has led to the practical results of measurement. That's it exactly. Miss Henrietta Leavitt, the Harvard Observatory, working on uh, some variable stars in a distant galaxy, the, the, the small cloud of Magellan in the southern sky, first noted that the longer the period, the brighter the star. The longer the period of vibration, the greater the candle power of the star. And she did that for 25 stars. Well, in, over the next 10 years, I perfected that by examining many stars in many different places, and we built up what we call that period luminosity relation. Well, there again, it was applying the observation to the... Uh, and to, without the observations, we wouldn't have done anything. Nobody had ever thought of a pulsing star. Well, one man did. A German worked once, and he said if you had a big mass of gas and gave it a whack, then it would vibrate for a while, and what he called the second harmonic would persist. That means one type of its vibration wouldn't die out soon, and it'd go on. But he's talking then about masses of gas, about the star. and I don't think he knew one end of a star from the other. He was a mathematical <laughs> physicist. Well, now, in this case, the, the theory, the hypothesis, followed, came after the observation period. Is that always true in, in your field or in the other sciences? Practically always true, but it goes on from there. After the theory came of the pulsation hypothesis and some other types of theories, it incites many more observations. And so the Cepheid variable stars have been observed and analyzed observationally ten times as much before we now since the theory, then we examine them before then you the had, theory. Had time so it goes together. Deduction, then induction. Leading to more deduction. That's right. Well, does activity in one field of science, say your own field of astronomy, for example, automatically lead you to interest in other, scientists, uh, other sciences in general? It does me, and I think it does for most people in a limited way. If you get interested in the stars, and need to solve some particular problem, you get interested in the mathematics that has to be back of that. And now the whole science of astrophysics has been built up from bringing in atomic theory, namely physics, nuclear physics, to understand the stars. And so in that way it brings you to it because it becomes a part of the toolage, it's the physical sciences. You don't need to know much geology to study the stars. Uh, but you do need to know some languages to read what other people are doing, and you do need to know uh, physics. So when a person asks me, if you were going to ask me how should I start studying to become an astronomer, I'd say, don't bother about reading up on astronomy, but study your physics, especially your nuclear physics, your spectroscopy, your chemistry, a bit of geology, and some German and some Russian, then you come to me some afternoon, and I'll tell you all the astronomy you need to know to go off and be an astronomer, because it's basically, you see, uh, a gathering science. in of all of the other yes. related sciences. But come well, back I'm thinking your... now in terms of, of sciences that aren't uh, so directly related, your own interest, yes. for example, yes. in entomology. My interest in entomology, I think, came partly because I've always been what I would frankly admit is sort of scatterbrained and interested in many things, rather wide things. I nearly started out as a classicist, and uh, I'm afraid I retained some of the shall we say, the armor of classics. But uh, a thing that always appealed to me was the woods. And that's why here we are talking, we're surrounded by 100 acres of woods. At the Mount Wilson Observatory, as a young observer, I could work on the stars at night, but when daytime comes, what would you have to do? So I wandered around the mountainsides quite a bit and developed what we call an ecology a uh, listing of the plants and the animals that uh, are at different altitudes in the canyons and their surroundings. And that led me to an 
little hobby that got too serious because I published papers in it. And one thing you shouldn't do with a hobby, seems to me, is to take it so seriously that you become sort of expert. In it. Well, I never became very much of an expert, but uh, I was sitting one day after a long night's observing on Mount Wilson, waiting for another night to come so I could go after the Cepheid variables or the globular star clusters, and uh, I noticed that one particular kind of an ant that I hadn't seen before was running along a concrete wall. The sun was shining on it, but the manzanita bushes were uh, throwing shadows against the wall, and I noticed that the ants slowed up when they were in the shadows, as though they wanted to take it in the cool and hurried through the hotter parts. But of course, that was a little anthropocentric, that idea, and I observed it further, and I saw a chance to make an experiment. Just why do they go faster when it's hot? And, and uh, I commenced setting up apparatus. Thermometer, barometer, hygrometer, and all of those things near the trail. And I set up a speed trap, we would call it now. I set off 30 centimeters of the wall marked that was in the shadow and 30 in the sunshine. And with a stopwatch, I timed the speed of the ants going back and forth in that. Well, it was a lovely sort of a goings-on because I came to a rather significant result, which we should have foreseen because it turned out that the speed was controlled by the air temperature near the surface where they were running. And had nothing to do with the intensity of the light, for example. With in, not with the intensity of the light, it's the temperature, nor with the humidity. They would run on the edge of snow very slowly, and they'd run in the heat of the sun at 100 degrees Fahrenheit very rapidly. I set up the curve and got to a place where we could tell the temperature on Mount Wilson by observing the speed of ants within one degree. Rather amusing little hobby, but it's led to, in other places, to quite a lot of research along the line of relating temperature to activity of various kinds of animals. Well, you were talking uh, a moment ago about a, uh, a happy hunch or yes. inspiration. Do you, in the course of your observations, suddenly conceive of an idea that, that is perhaps off on a different tangent, but promises to be a good one. Uh, yes, I say that frequently you come to a sudden spurt of imagination and you'll say, is this perhaps the answer? And uh, it's something like intuition. You jump over the valleys in going from hill to hill. Some people have that uh, art much more pronounced than others. And some of us take it in a very routine sort of way. I've had a few jumps, I would say, and I don't see why I suddenly commence saying that, but that's because I don't follow all of my thoughts all the way through. Professor Russell Princeton, my teacher in astronomy uh, years ago, was one of those people that you could call a genius, and uh, he didn't bother to plow through the details in the valley of knowledge, but jump from one peak to the other. It was rather interesting to see how he could come to it. And we say he's inspired. He has, he's a hunch man. But later you'll find that he knew all that in between, but he hadn't vocalized it. Or maybe he hadn't even mentalized it. In a number of creative activities, as such, in the arts in particular, there's a very clear and definite aspect of, of the creator revealing himself. We say that a painter paints a picture of himself, what's in his mind. A writer writes the story of what's in his mind. Is there any of this self-revealing in science? I'd say there's very little, except there's some self-revealing in making your choice of a project to be studied or of the method of studying it. For instance, a person that's very good in mathematics is going to tackle a problem about the interior of a star different from a spectroscopist with a machine. Indicating something of the structure of his own mind thereby. It's indicating, I think, as much his training and maybe his inborn facility in doing certain things, rather than revealing himself the way a poet might reveal himself. Walt Whitman, for instance. You're always studying that personality when you're reading his poetry. Can we, can we then say that research of itself is a, is a really creative activity? Yes, if you define creative widely enough. To me, there's a continuous stream of method from a straight, single observation, an observation such as the sun is now shining, from that all the way to 
an inspired mathematical theory, as some mathematicians have produced them. To me, scientific research is all inspiration, but then that's my definition of inspiration. So do we, uh, in science, I'm trying to think, do we do things such as a musician will in composing a symphony? He's very methodical in many ways. He does a whole lot of laborious work to us that are not composing. We'd say that's not so very routine at all. It's inspiration. But to him, of course, uh, it's a lot of it is routine. Oh, yes. There, there, there's no denying that at all. Locke will give a little theme and then work it over and work it over and work it over from all different standpoints. And that's pretty routine, I'd say, and beautiful. I think we can probably draw a pretty close parallel there. I believe we can. I think we've hit on something at that moment of comparing the routine work that uh, a poet must do in being sure he has the right word, the right rhythm, the right picture he wants, and a lot of that be routine, to the routine work of observing certain chemical combinations and how they behave under certain conditions. I remember that someone is said to have complimented Alfred Lord Tennyson on some particular line in some poet, light, sudden, inspired line. And he replied, hmm, that took two long black cigars to get that one out. <laughs> <laughs> well, this, this leads me then to a, a somewhat larger question, and that is, can we say that once we've gotten through this, this process of research, of reasoning and so forth, and, and reached the inspired idea, can we describe this as a moment of discovery? This is a phrase I know you've used in some of your writings. Yes, a moment of discovery. A, the word moment can be defined a little bit. A moment may be that month of those years, oh, or yes. it might be that second. It's a relative business about a moment of discovery. It does mean, in general, a change of direction in which you're operating and following along some line that you hadn't been following before. And then this does require original thinking, creative thinking. Yes. Almost all of this work takes what I'd call original thinking. You have a pattern set up by somebody else who's done the same thing, but in just routine observation, uh, like uh, making a botany, as I have done, of uh, this place in the country. It took thinking all the time to know how you're correlating it, whether you've gone to the right places you know, whether you've got the right seasons and all. So thinking is all the way through. I don't see how we get away from it. We often talk about people not thinking. I don't see how they can stop it. Well, now, in this uh, line of talk about the thinking that goes into reaching the, the moment of discovery, we've mentioned your uh, building up, uh, discovering the hypothesis regarding the Cepheid stars. Are there other illustrations within your own particular field of specialization well, we I could bring in? Well, I suppose that if I am expected to talk about myself, that I should say that probably the thing that I have contributed has been most significant is the discovery of what we call the eccentric universe. Discovery of the position of sun, earth, moon, planets in our galaxy of stars. About five, six thousand years ago we didn't even have a geocentric theory of the universe. The idea was egocentric, the individual, or his village, lococentric we might call it. And then with the Greeks and the others of two to three thousand years ago, gradually came the idea that the Earth was the center, and we talked about the geocentric hypothesis. Well, there is some questioning of that, but it took Copernicus about 420 years ago to uh, come through with a hypothesis that we now call the heliocentric theory. The sun is the center. The Earth goes around the sun yeah. rather than the other way. That was a heliocentric, but it applied not only to the planetary system, the sun and his group of planets, but applied to the stars too, because at that time, up to 1920, we believed that the stars fell off in all directions. That seemed to indicate we were at the center. And so the books were publishing, the textbooks, up to about 25 years ago, that uh, the sun and earth were the center of the whole system of stars, and we knew there were millions of stars. And then my contribution in there, which came with 
tremendous speed when I got it started, and therefore you might say a moment of discovery, was that we are not anywhere near the center, but that the center of our galaxy of stars is some 25 million light years away in the southern Milky Way. That is 25 million times 6 million million miles. We were off center, or as I call it, eccentric hypothesis of the universe. That was one of the developments that you might call creative, but if I hadn't done it, somebody else would have done it before this, I'm sure, because it was just there for the picking and for the labor. It took a lot of work. I must have published 200 papers uh, on that general subject of our location and the consequences of it. And still it stays right where we put it in that time, about 1917. The distance, we've worried about that, may not be as far away as we thought, or further away, we're still working on it. Is this a different kind of knowledge from that that we acquire in, in an artistic sort of creativity, in painting a picture or writing a book or composing a symphony? Yes, a great deal we do in science is uncovering, you might say, rather than discovering in the way of getting something that didn't exist before. But it's mixed a little bit. In general, I'd say that we, when we build a theory of uh, the uh, orbital motion of Jupiter is affected by Saturn or something of that kind, we're doing creative job, same as the artist. Not so much in expressing ourselves at all, but making something that didn't exist before. Now we're making it for men. We haven't affected the Saturn or Jupiter, but for man's theory, we have done a creative job. And this does definitely tie in with artistic creativity. And I think a good deal of the mathematical theory and a good deal of the interpretational thing. And the ingenuity in instruments, you see, there's a great deal of artistry there. And that leads me to one more question, and that is in regard to the responsibility of the scientist to his society. Is there a difference in his responsibility as a scientist from that to his responsibility simply as an individual citizen? A scientist's responsibility as a scientist is high and is limited to his science. But his responsibility as a citizen should not be depreciated just because he's a specialist somewhere else. And frequently when you're talking about scientists, I mean, the people at large are talking about scientists, they're thinking of the inventors, the gadgeteers, the engineers. But scientists are different from that, including the fact that they sometimes are engineers. They very often need the techniques of the engineer, but they need more than that. Yes. Technology is a child of science, and of course that has led many people to have a considerable respect for science because they have respect for technology. It's made living much more happy, much more effective. Scientists are making more contributions along that line than they used to. At the end of the war, people had a little too much of technology perhaps for a while, and they worried a good deal about the scientists saying things. But as you say, they were the philosophers, and they still are the philosophers. I'll quote. Professor Whitehead, I remember his saying one time to a group of us that there have been no great advances in philosophy as such since the times of the Greeks. At the present time, the real advances in philosophy have come from the scientists, and thank heaven they don't know it. Harlow Shapley, the theoretical scientist as creator. Conversation number four in a series exploring the creative process as it pertains to the American artist and scientist in the 20th century. Host for the creative mind, Lyman Bryson. Producer for the series, Jack D. Summerfield, with William Kavnis and Nadja Eisenberg as production associates. Next week, Aaron Copeland, the composer as creator. The Creative Mind is produced and recorded by WGBH-FM in Boston for the National Association of Educational Broadcasters under a grant from the Educational Television and Radio Center. This program was distributed by the National Educational Radio Network.